Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Rom Whitaker. He was born in New York City and came to India when he was seven. He's a herpetologist with hundreds of publications and co-founder of the Madras Snake Park, Andaban and Nicobar Environment Trust, ANET, and the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. In 1984, Whitaker won a Rolex Award for Enterprise for starting a snake venom cooperative for Irula Tribals, and again in 2008 for his efforts to create a network of rainforest research stations throughout India. In 2005, he was the winner of a Whitley Award to found the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station in Karnataka for the study of king cobras and their habitat. Despite his messages, Whitaker has made 30 documentaries for channels such as National Geographic, BBC and Animal Planet, and a children's feature film. For his work in wildlife conservation, he received the Government of India's Padma Shri Award in 2018. And we spoke before, and I just want to thank you again for your great work on gharials, which I am just profoundly in love with that animal. And so I would like to thank you for your work in the world, and thank you for being on the program. Thanks very much, Derek. It's great to be on the program. So, like I said, last time we talked about king cobras and also about uh, gharials. And can you talk this time about um, venomous snakes in India and the problem of snake bites? Yeah, I, I certainly can. And um, let me start with some pretty basic information about the fact that there are over 300 different species of snakes in this tropical land of India. And uh, they range from little tiny worm snakes all the way up to giant pythons, well over 20 feet long. But uh, in between, there are some very serious snakes, some very seriously venomous snakes, which just love us because we create the habitat and the food source for them. Now, this is getting down to the fact that 70% of Indians are agriculturalists, they're farmers, they live out in the rural parts of India, and uh, the, the stuff that they grow, rice and millets and stuff like that, grains for example, are fantastic rodent food. Now this has attracted great concentrations of rodents in and around their houses and in the fields of course, which of course attracts their predators, which are the snakes. Two of the very big predators, rat predators, are also two of the most important venomous snakes of India. One is called the Indian cobra, which is a famous snake all over the world, the snake that spreads its hood, and the snake charmer plays its flute, and the snake supposedly dances to the music, even though it's deaf. And the second snake is called the Russell's viper. The, these two snakes cause most of the serious snake bites in India and, and the snake bite deaths. And there are two others which are combined we call, we refer to them as the big four venomous snakes of India, the most common dangerous snakes. And they are the crate, K-R-A-I-T, and the saw-scaled viper. So there are four snakes, the cobra, the Russell's viper, the crate, and the saw-scaled viper, which cause as many as 60,000 human deaths every year in this country. This sounds fantastic. It sounds just over the top, but it is a, uh, a definite, uh, tremendous burden for rural India, and there are many reasons for it. Uh, first of all, the fact is prevention or preventing these snake bites would seem to be the best way to uh, attack the problem because... Uh, the treatment for snake bite is a bit complicated. Antivenom serum is the only treatment for snake bite, and it's only available at larger district hospitals. Now, if you're living way out in the boondocks or way out in the in a village in India, the chances of getting to a hospital in time to to treat a snake bite are are, are, are less. And uh, although there are ambulance services in many of the states in India, there are plenty of parts of India where the ambulance doesn't reach or you won't even have a phone signal to get a hold of an ambulance. So we're talking about a very serious problem here. Um, the way the government has approached it is the production of antivenom is made in uh, uh, four or five different companies around the country and they produce as many as a million and a half vials of antivenom. Now this is a large quantity of antivenom, but it has to be distributed and distributed free to rural people uh, at the at the right place and at the right time of the year. 
the right time of year is during the rainy season when snakes are very uh, active, searching around for their prey, getting forced out of their hiding places because of high water. This is the time when snake bites are the maximum. And very often snake bites happen at night. And if a snake bite happens at night and a, 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 a patient has to get to a hospital, it's going to be even more difficult to find a, way, a means of getting him there. And will there be a doctor on call? The second thing that's really uh, problematic is that in India we've got um, tribal, uh, let's say tribal uh, and herbal and indigenous sort of healing systems which have evolved over the centuries, which are great for common colds and you know and sort of basic stuff. Now you've got a life-threatening experience, a snake bite, and people still rely on some of these herbal remedies and other remedies which are not going to help at all. There is, and I keep repeating, there's only one sort of treatment that's for sure, and that's antivenom. So, uh, let me, yeah, go ahead. So, can we can we back up for a second? And um, I presume that the venomous, that the venom in most snakes is is primarily for killing their food, mm-hmm. and um, and then is not generally meant for defense, except in except when they're pretty scared themselves. Is that accurate? That's that's accurate. Yeah, of course it works very well as defense, and uh, it creates the uh, the aura around snakes that yes, this is something to leave alone. And animals are very instinctively aware of this, and uh, certainly know know to be cautious with snakes. So how does how do, I know that there is different sorts of venom for different for the different snakes but how does the venom generally work and then how does anti venom work and also for people in the United States I'd like I know that rattlesnakes can be pretty scary but um they're not as serious as some of these like if somebody gets you said 60,000 deaths a year 50,000 deaths if yeah. If somebody gets bitten, go through the process. Do they have an hour to get the antivenom, or do they have 24 hours, or do they have three days, or do they have 15 minutes? How, how does that work? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, – well, I'm going to generalize because it is a little bit complicated, but in general, first of all, different species of snakes have different kinds of venoms, and – the, the two sort of basic categories are the neurotoxic venom, the nerve-affecting venoms, and the hematoxic venoms, those which affect the blood, bones, and tissue. And uh, the neurotoxic snakes, are, like the cobra and the crate, are very highly toxic. You do have several hours' time to get to a hospital, unless uh, it's an, an incredibly large dose of venom, but usually, in general, there is time to get to a hospital if you have two or three hours, and time enough to get to, uh, to a source of antivenom. Uh, just to compare it to the United States and rattlesnakes, I believe there are as many as two dozen deaths by uh, snake bite in the United States every year uh, out of thousands of bites that happen. And uh, the, the good thing there is that hospital treatment is usually fairly rapidly available, and the antivenom there is a very high quality and very high strength which is another problem here in India. We have, uh, our antivenoms are not up to par, even though they're the least expensive antivenoms in the world, they're not the best antivenoms. Okay, snake venom, actually, the, the, is the vital ingredient to making antivenom, and uh, that is because they use venom to immunize horses, which becomes the host animal for producing the serum which is used to make, which is the antivenom to save lives. Now, the problem with horse serum is that a large percentage of people are allergic to it, and uh, so a doctor or at least a trained paramedic is the only person who can give the antivenom intravenously, because if an allergic reaction takes place, a quick injection of adrenaline has to be given to save the person. So it's not just a simple give a pill or rub something on and he's okay. It's a, it's a little more complicated treating a snake bite. And also I want to back up a little bit that you – one of the first things you said was you talked about sort of the ecological reasons for um, for this with with grains attracting rodents who then attract the, the snakes. So 
are the four snakes that you talked about, um, are they, uh, doing fairly well themselves? Are their populations, uh, pretty robust? Um, or is there, I mean, because, because there are so many rats, because of all the grain growing, does that mean those snake populations have increased commensurate? I, I do believe so, yes. Our, a study has yet to be done, but when someone says, uh, don't go into the jungle, it's dangerous, there are snakes there and so on, I would usually laugh and say, actually there's many more snakes out in your rice fields than in the jungle. It is true, the number of, the, uh, concentration of prey in rice fields and similar agriculture is such that it does attract and does proliferate great numbers of snakes and that's why that's one of the reasons why we have this big problem and that's one reason why we've started telling people rodent control is probably the answer to the problem and i know this is a trivial a trivial question but evidently nights are much warmer there because in the united states reptiles don't get around much at night for the most part because it's so cold and That's, so, are, are the, are the, are the, do these creatures, are they active at night often? Yes, most definitely. Um, the, the cobra is uh, both diurnal as well as nocturnal. Uh, the Russell's viper is more nocturnal, spends more time hunting at night. And the crate in particular is a nocturnal, very strictly nocturnal snake, which does, uh, have the nasty habit of entering people's houses or huts mostly, and in search of rodents. And if someone's sleeping on the ground or on the floor, which is very common in India, especially in the hot season, a bite can happen, and this does happen. So how did you get started working on this particular issue, snake bite as opposed to reptiles in general? Uh, I, I think it's kind of a guilt complex because uh, I've been the kid uh, from, the way, from, from the time I was a kid anyway. I've been, the, uh, you know, promoting how wonderful snakes are and uh, how useful they are in the ecosystem. You know, they control rodents. My goodness, you know, you've got to protect snakes. Then when you look around you and you see that you've got snakes causing this tremendous problem of snake bite, is really something that anyone who likes snakes better do something about it. So that's that's where it all started. If 50,000 people a year is, is a reasonable, this is a reasonable sized city. Yes. It is. So, and, and what's the, um, so you talked about prevention being the most important. Can you talk about the important, can you talk more about prevention? Yeah, I, we have some real basic, uh, advice to give to people and we found that, uh, us talking about it isn't really so great because, uh, they, people say, yeah, yeah, these guys, uh, mess with snakes they, they can say anything we won't listen to them so we've started using a tact of getting someone who's a snake bite survivor to start helping us with our education programs for example by saying I was bitten by a snake because I walked outside to go and turn the water pump on and I didn't use my flashlight I had the flashlight in my hand but and I've been walking this this path to the pump house almost every day of my life for the last 10 years and I've never stepped on a snake but that night without the light I stepped on a snake so so using a light at night would probably prevent nearly 50% of the bites that happen because a majority of bites do in the statistics that we have the majority of bites do happen on the feet or the legs and if you have a light and you're looking where you're walking chances are you won't step on that snake and disturb it to the degree that it's defending its life so I don't remember if I mentioned this to you, but I've mentioned this many times before, that where I live, I see bears every day. And I see them outside. I'll, I mean, it's, and they don't, that I see them every, all the time, so I'm not, I'm not scared of them. And people will say, oh my gosh, you must be so scared of bears. But there's only one person or two, I think one person dies every two years in North America because of a black bear attack. And, so I'm thinking with 50,000 people die every year, doesn't that make a lot of a tremendous uh, hatred of snakes and a tremendous fear of snakes? That's the strange dichotomy of India, isn't it? Because uh, snakes are worshipped to a great degree uh, amongst the Hindu population of India, which is the majority population. Almost any temple you go to anywhere in the country, there will be a carving or an image of a snake. 
and particularly the cobra. So you've got religion on the snake side there. Also, there's a, a feeling in India about killing animals in general. It's just, it's not uh, similar to the, the rest of the world. There are many places where people will kill a snake on sight, particularly if there has been a, a case of someone dying from snake bite in the village or they know about it. But by and large, uh, at least half the population will leave the snake alone and let it go its own way. So much of your education is is literally like things you can do to not get bit as opposed to trying to educate. In the United States, you really have to educate people a lot about, for example, wolves because there's a in the western United States especially, there's a tremendous hatred of wolves. So you don't have to do that work quite so much as you just have to say, take a flashlight or... Or be careful when you're sleeping. I mean, what? Can, well, that's another question in a moment. But so it's 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 mainly technical stuff. Then is that right? Yeah, it is. Uh, when you say be careful when you're sleeping, uh, we recommend using a mosquito net because that saves you against malaria, dengue fever, all these mosquito-borne diseases, possibility of a scorpion sting, and of course a snake bite. So using a, a mosquito net at night. Watching where you're walking, not only during the night with a light, but during the day when they're doing harvest. Most people go into the rice fields barefoot because it's very convenient. It's the way you do it. Uh, to try to convince people to wear boots is going to be a, an uphill battle. But we are trying, and uh, in certain parts of the country, we've got uh, some very success, good success rates with people actually work, using boots in the field and reducing snake bite that way. So these, as you say, yeah, there are technical things that people have to learn to do. It's mostly being aware and looking what you're doing. When a lady reaches for a stack of firewood or some hay out of a haystack, she has to look first or use a stick first and then pull it out because that's where the snake might be hiding. So we said 50,000 people um, die from snake bites. How many people get a serious snake bite every year? Now that's a really good question because uh, there's very little data on the number of snake bite survivors who could be permanently injured. But it is very high, and it could be upwards of a couple of hundred thousand people who are actually suffering from a permanent injury after a snake bite. The estimate is that there are nearly more than one million snake bites a year in India, uh, out of which uh, up to 60,000 die. So this is the latest statistic from something called the Million Death Study, which is done uh, from the University of Toronto with the Registrar General of India. The Million Death Study actually does something called verbal autopsies in a million households. That is, they go to the household with a doctor and a social worker and find out what the causes of death have been over the last period of time, in usually a one-year period. And this has given a very realistic estimate of the snake bite deaths in India because the hospital records... Are, are very scarce. Uh, people, uh, in fact, the vast majority of snake uh, bite mortality happens outside the hospital, not in the hospital at all. So the government statistics are way down around 1,500 deaths per year, whereas the million death study is as many as 60,000 deaths per year. So I, maybe you're not the right person to ask this question, but there are let's say 30 to 40,000 people die in the United States every year because of automobile accidents. And most of us in the world hear about automobile accidents. But honestly, and maybe this is just my own ignorance of the of, of what goes on around the world, but I think that a lot of people not in India would be very surprised to hear that there are that many deaths. Why don't more people hear about this? <laughs> About the snake bite deaths or about the automobile deaths? Oh, about, the, about the snake bite deaths. Yeah, well, this is actually something which has come forward in the World Health Organization just in the last couple of years. Um, there's something called neglected tropical diseases, which include dengue and many of the others, uh, mostly mosquito-borne diseases. And snake bite has never figured in until very recently. Now that it's on as called a Category A neglected tropical disease, suddenly governments, in, particularly in these countries, in sub-Saharan Africa and Asian countries, are suddenly waking up and taking notice of it. And the, I, it's, it's, it mystifies me, too, actually, that why isn't it given more publicity and more, uh, you know, more support, for example, for, for, for fixing the problem? 
And you you sent me a video before, and then also um, you mentioned earlier the the remedies that that people try that don't work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is, goes way back in time. Uh, and when I first met the Irlit tribals, the, the people who we set up the venom center for, they showed me the various medicines, the herbal medicines they use for snake bite. And uh, the problem with these medicines are that they're ingested, and uh, if you ingest a medicine, it's going to take hours and hours, maybe even up to 12 hours before it reaches the blood system, whereas when you get a bite from a snake, it's injecting it straight into the blood. And uh, when I talked to the tribal people, I, I certainly didn't want to denigrate you know, their uh, ancient knowledge and so on, and, and like I said before, for other uh minor diseases and stuff. Some of their herbal remedies are fantastic. But when we had this discussion with them, when we set up their cooperative, we said, look, the snake is giving you an injection. So you've got to get an injection to counter that. And that, that just the, the simplicity of that explanation works wonders. I, I will always tell them, go ahead and chew your medicines and swallow them, but on the way to hospital to get that injection. Mm-hmm. And this has made a lot of difference. We've probably saved quite a few lives that way. So let's move to the next step. I mean, once somebody's bitten, and let's talk about anti-venom production. I want to read something from the article you sent to me because I have traditionally not known very much about anti-venom production. But what I did know always made me a little bit concerned for the snakes because it seems like I don't know. They get they get kind of a raw deal in in having to produ- produ- do their part for it. But then I was reading that you said um, in the article you sent it said uh, the society that's the Snake Catchers Industrial Cooperative Society is licensed uh, to capture an average of eight thousand snakes per year, and snakes are kept in captivity for three or four weeks and venom extracted four times from each snake, and then they're released back into the wild. And I have to tell you. That made me feel a lot better. And I know we're talking about a lot of humans dying, but it still made me feel a little bit better that the snakes aren't stuck in little containers for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that's very true, but very controversial also, because people are saying that, well, studies have been done, not much here, unfortunately, but in the United States and elsewhere, where where you catch a snake in one place and release it in another place out of its own original home range, and the chances of its survival are very le- very low. So, in fact, the World Health Organization has said that India now has to start following the same uh, protocols as other countries like the United States, where snakes are kept in captivity, bred in captivity, kept well, of course, and, uh, and only captive snakes will be used, wild snakes will no longer be used, because there's a lack of traceability of the snakes, and the product that they're producing, the venom, has to be traceable. Uh, on good management practice and all this kind of uh, uh, very essential uh, scientific reasons for doing it right, uh, it's much better that snakes are kept in captivity than taken from the wild. But yeah, of, co- of course. Of, yeah, that, that was my concern is snakes being taken out of the wild. So talk more about that process of producing the anti-venom and, um, and, and how how that actually works. I mean, you mentioned the horses, but can you go into a little bit more detail about about how the anti-venom works? Yeah, actually, by uh, this was started uh, in the late 1800s. It started, uh, actually, India and Vietnam produced the first uh, anti-venoms, and uh, it was basically by immunizing horses with tiny uh, doses of uh, venom and gradually increasing the dosage over a period of six or eight months until the horse builds up resistance. Now, there's, there's various ways of testing it. Uh, usually they use mice tests. They inject a small amount of venom into a, a mouse, a test mouse, and then a certain amount of the serum to see that the titer, that the strength of the serum is, is good enough to actually neutralize the amount of venom injected. So this is the basic um, methodology of making the uh, of antivenom, and it's remained unchanged for well over 150 years. Uh, there are now changes which have to be made. Uh, 
for example, there are different kinds of purification processes so that there are no more allergic reactions to the horse serum, which I had mentioned earlier, and also a way of making the antivenom much stronger, so smaller doses are needed, and our smaller doses would be just as effective. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change subjects again for a moment, and you mentioned the 50,000 deaths, but, um, the ecology, I mean, the, the biomes, I mean, there have to be venomous snakes also in other parts of the world. Do you know the deaths in other countries? Like have, surrounding countries? Yeah, we have figures, uh, several figures from neighboring countries like Bang- Bangladesh, for example, which is very high. It has a much smaller population, human population, but it's also, probably equal to in terms of uh, density of snake bites in certain areas to, to that in India. In other parts of Asia, their figures are not very uh, accurate or we haven't been able to get, but nonetheless throughout Asia, snake bite deaths are pretty high, as well as sub-Saharan Africa. But no one has the kind of death rate that India has, for one thing, no one has the population except China. So we're with 1.3 billion people, and uh, like I said, 70% of them rural people, and they are all possible snake bite victims. So you've you've talked about those two approaches: the first, education, and second, anti-venom. What other what other um, approaches? I guess one we haven't really talked about is prevention in the first place by um, by not improving conditions for for rats and mice is is that something that's seriously is that is that something that you can work on very much too yeah it's uh, it's certainly something that has to be attacked uh, vigorously but and it hasn't uh, up till now um, there are various uh, pesticide uh, let's say pest control agencies which are working on you know eradicating rats from rice fields and so on and interestingly enough, we got a grant some years ago for the Irlas to do it with their hands-on technology. They actually get in there and dig out the rodent burrows and catch the rats. So over a period of six months, we had a test showing that their method would be better than the uh, pesticide method, and they caught 240,000 rats and, uh, and salvaged about five tons of grain from the big little granaries that each rat sort of stockpiles down in the field. So we thought we had proved that the, the sort of biological method of rat control would be probably far more effective and far better for the ecosystem than pesticides, but it still has to take off. It, it, it's something that I'd love to see happen. But yeah, I think uh, the, the idea of keeping rodents out of people's houses is extremely important, and there are sort of very basic uh, ways of doing that, filling in the cracks and holes where rats can get in. It's a little more difficult for people living in a, in a hut made out of uh, mud and uh, palm leaf roof because uh, it's just like rat heaven in a place like that. But the consciousness of keeping rats away and keeping uh, children sleeping off the ground and these kind of things, they are all preventative uh, things that we're trying to teach people through the education programs that we have. Let's let's go back to to the to the snakes themselves, and I don't know if this is true, but I remember reading many years ago that bites from baby rattlesnakes are a little bit more um, dangerous than adult rattlesnakes because they haven't yet learned to control the amount of venom that they release. And is that true that the 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 snake can release? Uh, can choose how much venom to release into into the target. Oh yeah, that's most definitely true. The uh, the snake it, it's strictly a voluntary thing. If it wants to, if it's really excited, really frightened, injured, it's more likely to react in in this a very forceful manner and inject more venom. And then with regard to a, a smaller snake being more toxic, there is a chance, and uh, not necessarily more toxic, but giving more venom. That's that's a distinct possibility, but perhaps more important is the fact that the venom from a baby snake is quite different from that of an adult snake. So the antivenom, which is almost always made from adult snakes in these various uh, uh, venom-producing scenarios, is perhaps not going to treat uh, 
the bite of a juvenile snake adequately. Luckily, a juvenile snake can only give a smaller quantity of venom, which is sort of a plus point. But there are quite a few complicated aspects of this venom variation. For example, in India, the the uh, Irla Cooperative, which we talked about, where most of the venom produced uh, for antivenom production is produced by the Irlas, all these snakes come from one district in the state of Tamil Nadu, where I live here, and it doesn't uh, represent the geographic variations that could be take, have taken place in snakes from other parts of India. This is quite a vast country. So it's very important that snakes from all around the country are actually brought to one place, and the venom from these is pooled and made into an antivenom that would be effective throughout the country. We, we know this because clinicians tell us, look, I've given a hundred vials of antivenom and the person did not survive. What's happening? Why didn't it work? And it's probably, almost surely, because of this great geographic variation of the venoms. So, sorry again for the ignorant questions, but when someone's bit by a snake, um, does it, does it, uh, does the venom also hurt quite a bit or I mean, obviously, getting punctured is going to hurt some, but but it, are are the snake bites really painful as well? Yeah, it varies quite a bit. In the case of the cobra and the vi- the two vipers, the pain is very severe, and uh, I've uh, had the honor of being nailed a couple of times by snakes. Uh, and in the United States, I was bitten by a prairie rattlesnake in Texas, and uh, it felt very much like someone putting a hot iron into my hand and just sort of not relenting, <laughs> just pushing it through. There was very, very severe throbbing pain. So yes, uh, it's a immediate, very, very painful reaction. The exception is the crate. The crate is the snake, which I mentioned before, is nocturnal. It travels around at night and often enters people's houses and sometimes bites people while they're asleep. And they might wake up and feel something, but it's not a very painful thing. And the problem is the venom is very toxic and Because it's not very painful, they don't have the urgency or think that they have to get to a hospital fast or anything like that. But uh, the venom is so toxic that the person could die before morning. So this is another problem. The the pain actually, you know, brings on the urgency for treatment, which is very important. And again, this is this is off the topic of of human snake bites. Um, But so when they bite a rat. Um, how long does it take for the rat to die, and how do they track it? Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, the, this, the rat very, very often may live for a minute or two if the, the venom has been injected deep. It, it doesn't usually live long, but it, in that minute or two, it can bounce away pretty fast. Snakes have got an incredibly well-developed sense of smell using their tongues, which is an organ of taste, feel, and smell. And uh, if you watch a snake and you see it tonguing, especially if it's in hungry mode or if it's traveling somewhere and it's, it's trying to figure out its surroundings. It's using its tongue constantly and flicking it around and then bringing it back into its mouth. And in the roof of the mouth is a pair of organs called Jacobson's organs, which interpret what the snake has been smelling and feeling. So, yes, the snake, as soon as he's bitten a rat or another animal, he'll, and the animal sort of totters off and dies the snake will follow it as much as 100 yards or even more and eventually track it down. We've watched king cobras uh, bite uh, a snake and actually even uh, more than an hour later still following the snake's, another snake's trail and even up into a tree but relentlessly tracking it down and and getting it to swallow it. And what are the largest... um the largest animals that are regular play prey for any of these snakes? Well, in case of the venomous snakes, uh, it's, it's r- the larger rats would be the biggest snakes. In the case of the king cobra, which is an exception, and, and we don't even bring the king cobra into the uh, uh, sort of arena of, of being a snake, which is uh, dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous to people potentially because it's so huge and it's got so much venom but it very rarely bites anybody. It's a very alert snake. It stays out of the way, and people can see it. But if it, uh, is, if we're talking about prey, sometimes they kill and eat 
pythons, which was a big surprise to us. But uh, we've got some incredible f- uh, photographs of a, of, a, of a king cobra biting a python, and the, the python wraps around the king cobra, and we're actually not going to interfere with what's going on. It's happening in nature, so let it go on. But it really looked like the king cobra was in serious trouble. But by the time the venom started taking effect, the python relaxed and let the king cobra go, and the king cobra subsequently swallowed the python, and man, did he get fat. I mean, it was, <laughs> they really gorged themselves. Okay, so let's go back to the to the anti-venom efforts. And um, when you have fifty thousand people dying per year, um, that seems a significant ho- public health concern. How much how much money is is thrown at this by um, both the Indian government and I don't know World Health Organization and various philanthropies. I mean various various large organizations. That that seems like a huge health crisis that should have a boatload of money thrown at it. Very true. Um, we're hoping for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're actually, uh, in fact, coincidentally, I've been invited to a meeting at the end of this month in New Delhi, the capital, where we are going to discuss this very thing. There's uh, several trusts in the world, uh, including the Wellcome Trust in the UK, which has uh, committed, I think, nearly $10 million to the snake bite problem. The WHO has set up they don't usually fund things directly themselves, but the donor agencies that and the state governments uh, around the world, which contribute to the, to the United Nations, all comes to a, as you say, something that re- we really need to put major funding into this. Uh, on a local level, we've been able to get corporate uh, donations uh, in order to do the education programs around the country. And we're in partner uh, partnership with several other non-government organizations as well as some of the state government organizations to, to do this. But certainly it's just ramping up now, as I said earlier, and you queried about this earlier, how come people don't know about it. It's just now coming into the, full, uh, into the fore, and I think uh, we're looking forward to a lot more support. So... You mentioned you mentioned earlier in passing that um, anti venom is much cheaper in India than in some places. Yeah. I believe you mentioned that, but it's it's in one of the articles you sent me. And why this extraordinary difference that it's United States six dollars and fifty cents to ten dollars or eleven dollars in India, and it's nineteen hundred dollars per vial in the United States. Amazing. Yeah, I don't. It, it's why it doesn't add up, does it? <laughs> does, I mean, I'm glad uh, it's cheap there. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a, a very difficult thing for me to explain because I'm not on your side over there. But, uh, there are some articles which have been written about it. And, uh, the fact is that we can, we are actually producing in, antivenom at a very low price, but, uh, that's because the government has regulated that price. And the antivenom producers would love to make more money out of it and thus be able to increase the, uh, Potency, which is something I talked about earlier, and and the cleanliness of it, less allergic reactions and so on. So this is another another point which has to be debated when we have this meeting in, in Delhi at the end of the month, that the antivenom pro- uh, producers have to be paid more in order to produce a better antivenom. So we have about six or seven minutes left, and... What do you see happening in the um, mid-term, the short to mid-future uh, on this particular issue? Well, in the short term, the existing antivenom, which is made for those big four dangerous snakes of India, the cobra, the Russell's viper, the crate, and the Saskia viper, has to be improved, greatly improved. This is the short term. Not only greatly improved, but uh, it has to be distributed to the right places at the right time. In the long term, there's uh, there are various uh, uh, scientists working on what's called the new generation of antivenoms. That is, antivenoms which are more specifically geared to the species which uh, cause the bites and to the particular kinds of toxins which are in their venoms. This is a complicated and very very lengthy sort of process which is happening and uh, almost every 
a month or so, you hear a, another headline saying a new uh, antivenom, a, a great breakthrough in antivenom has been made. But none of these great breakthroughs are going to be used tomorrow. It's going to take years and years of clinical, preclinical and clinical trials to make sure they work and they work well. The main thing right now, as I already mentioned, is to improve the existing antivenom that we have for the so-called big four snakes of India. That will really save a lot of lives. And also you mentioned earlier that, that the, the antivenom needs to be um, administered by a medical health professional, a doctor or an EMT or something. And I don't know, again, I don't know anything about India as in terms of this, but I live in a town of maybe 5,000 people and we have a hospital here. Um, so if we don't have, we don't have venomous snakes, but if we did and I got bit, I could easily go to the hospital and I could be there in five minutes. And since a lot of the people who are being bitten in India are, um, as you said, farmers, um, what is the typical, uh, how, how close is going to be their closest access to a medical health professional? That's, that's really the question that has to be answered. Uh, right now, the average person in a village is probably at least 45 minutes to an hour away from a medical facility where he can get antivenom. The thing is, uh, what vehicle would he or she use? Um, we've, we've, we've even recommended if, if there's a motorcycle available, which there usually is, make sure the patient sits in the, in the middle of between two, get three people on the back of that motorbike and the patient sits between the two. Just the main thing is to get them to hospital fast. Don't wait and don't try anything else. So this is our big message right now. It's just there should be no delay. Get them to the hospital as fast as you can. So what, how much success are you having with the technical questions of wearing the boots, um, using a flashlight, and then, like you just said, Sandwiching somebody between two other people on a motorcycle. Is that, are you, are you having great success in, first off, reaching people with that, and second, having them accept it once you, once you've given them the message? Yeah, it's kind of ups and downs, depending on which part of the country and which people, uh, but those, the short videos that we've made, uh, sort of very clearly show exactly what should be done and what shouldn't be done, which is also very important. And it seems to be working pretty well. But you're right in asking that question because this is something we are also very much aware of, that we have to measure results and measure success. But like I said earlier, it's nothing like getting a, a snake bite survivor on board our education programs to say why and how they got bitten and how they could have avoided it. Because just listening to us spout off stuff is uh, not as important as listening to someone who's actually been bitten and survived. And and I'm sorry for another ignorant question, but it, would it be accurate to say that um, in the United States, the way the way one would attempt to transmit this message would primarily be through, I'm thinking, um, the internet and television. And would would it be primarily in India through schools? I mean, how do you transmit the message primarily? I guess that's the question. Yeah, actually, through schools, it's incredibly important. But right now we're seeing uh, the, the rise in numbers of smartphones in villages is just phenomenal. And people are regularly going on to various uh, media sites, chat sites, and this kind of thing uh, in order to find, uh, well, content which, which uh, uh, they're entertained by, but which can also be used educationally. So making short clips of some of our video films is working great. But working in schools and community programs, getting people together for a, an, an evening, showing a video and giving a talk, and possibly even demonstrating a couple of snakes is incredibly effective in spreading the message. You know, one thing you said earlier that makes me really happy is is what you said about um, the the reverence or respect with which snakes are held by a good percentage of the population. Yep. 
It's in, yeah, go, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, it's incredible to 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 think that uh, despite the fact that snakes are potentially certain species anywhere, so, certainly so dangerous, people still have a reverence for them, and this has made our job a lot easier in many places. So that's an incredibly good start. So we just have we have like one or two minutes left. So so two questions. One is. Um, is there anything else that you want to say about this subject? I haven't given you the chance to. And the other is, um, if people care about this, what should they do? Oh, well, yeah, it's, um, the fact is, um, I'm, yeah, I'm sort of stuck at that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think because uh, because because the the solutions you've suggested are people on the ground can wear boots that's great and then also there's government or or large scale things like like making anti venom more um, cleaner and and then what what role I guess I guess for people in India too what role does citizen involvement play in this I guess that's my question. Actually, um, in, in terms of citizen involvement here, we've got uh, an a ext- incredibly good support base from people who uh, either contribute small amounts of money, uh, you know, to, which add up to uh, do, being able to do some of the projects we're running. And there's a, a huge network of people who are actually very positive about snakes, and many of them are so-called snake rescuers who are going out there and if there's a snake that comes into somebody's house and they would otherwise kill it, they call one of these rescuers who will very carefully go and remove the snake and let it go out, and out into a safe place. So there is a, a you know a lot of positive interest from that standpoint too. So then the other question was the one, the one I asked before was um, so is there anything else that you want to say about the question of snake bites in India, especially that I haven't given you the chance to? Well, I think it's kind of a reiteration of what I said. Snakes are an incredibly important part of the ecosystem there. As rodent controllers, we call them the friend of the farmer. So this is incredibly important animal to, to keep around. At the same time, people have got to recognize the fact that there are a few species, and very few species actually out of the over 300, which are capable of killing somebody or causing a very severe bite. And these snakes can be avoided our sort of message to the people is that snake bites are accidents that can be avoided, but a snake bite is a medical emergency, so go and get antivenom right away. That's the basic message. Okay, well, thank you so much for that, and, and thank you for being on the program, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Ron Whitaker. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Thanks, Derek. Great. <laughs>